does a chief design officer do at a bank, at a retailer, at a, at a healthcare company? Dan McCoskey's done all of those jobs. And he joins FigBrew with me, Andrew Hogan, Figma's head of insights, to tell us about it. This is an extension of a conversation that we have inside Figma called FigBrew. We talk about current events or links and essentially just raise our level of what's going on in the industry. We thought all of you might want to hear some of the conversations that we have. Hope you enjoy. Dan, thank you so much for being here. Uh, there's a story from your book that I think is fascinating where you describe being shown a shiny new office at uh, uh, one of your jobs um, at the top of a building and you decided that, uh, no, I want to work at the building across the street in the middle of everything with people walking by my desk. And I don't, I, I feel like I may be remembering like the chairs were maybe kind of like ripped up a little, even like, uh, tell me about that. Why, what, what happened? Why did you do it? I mean, it's interesting because this was my first proper chief design officer role. This was coming out from 10 years of Silicon Valley, going all the way across the pond to London to work for Lloyd's banking group, which is, uh, I don't know for a lot of the folks out in the US, but it's the largest digital bank in the UK. And it's got Bank of Scotland, Halifax Bank, Lloyd's Bank, Scottish Widows, Lex Auto Lease. You know, it's this whole massive portfolio of financial companies. And as you'd expect as, you know, the most senior executive role at a bank, they put me up in a corner office in headquarters, which is 25 Gresham Street in the city of London. You know, I show up and I go on my first day into these executive meetings on the very top floor of the Lloyd's building, which is right next to, you know, St. Paul's and it's like epic views of the city. And then after four or five hours of meetings, which that was kind of a cultural awakening experience in its own right, they said, well, let's take you to your office. So we go to my office and it's literally a corner office. And there's like two or three banks of desks outside of the office, almost like I don't know, almost like they're moats or city walls aimed at preserving and protecting executive time. So that was the first thing. I was like, well, beautiful office, but I'm like so isolated. And then I just asked the question, where's the design team? I said, well, there's no designers here in, you know, the headquarter office, uh, but the closest design places, you know, you walk through the Barbican Arts Center in the city of London and then Chiswell Street design studio, they're literally like on the basement floor behind the coffee area. Their design is kind of tucked away actually in a place that's not particularly even visible in that building. And I just said, can we go there? You know, the, the person that was orienting me that day was just, okay, well, fine. So we go over there, we walk through the Barbican Arts Center, which I thought was a nice metaphor of going from banking headquarters now into a creative space. You ran the chief design office of Lloyd's Bank from a basement, across the street from headquarters. Uh, I know you have also led design at Walmart. United Health Group most recently, yeah. A United Health Group most recently. And did you run those from basements as well? Or did you, like, it, was it the same philosophy or did you kind of like structure it a little differently? It was, I don't think it was quite as dramatic because in a lot of those environments, it's a lot more casual, Silicon Valley-like feeling of, you know, it's all open space, it's collaborative. Um, and what I, what I tended to do, um, in those areas was I did have a private office because a lot of my day was in calls and sometimes you're in calls with HR and they're sensitive stuff. So you need privacy, right? I'm not saying executives don't need that, but what I did is I just turned it into, I, I called it literally the chief design office, not Dan McCoskey's office. This was the chief design office and the chief design office was a resource to anyone on the team. So with United Health Group in the downtown Minneapolis design studio, there was a room that it, it, we labeled a chief design office and anyone on the team could use it because 90% of the time I wasn't there, I was traveling or I didn't need to use it. So it's so, a common space. Like you you made it as a common space. space. I know that there's lots of signals that we send and we get about people's power in an organization and their influence, who are they close to? You could have had a moat um, and instead you made sort of like a, maybe a corridor, I don't know, maybe maybe uh, yeah. a garden, some sort of yeah. in, inside garden. Were there, were there any downsides that you experienced to making 
you know, those kinds of decisions. Like, did, did people think you had less power? Did they think you had less influence? I mean, it's interesting. I, I don't think to the design team there was that. I, I think the design team appreciated the notion that, you know, the most senior leader who was representing their craft, their work, their jobs, their lives, their needs was, you know, in the, in their space, in their environment. I, mean, I wanted to send a signal to the culture that servant leadership isn't just a word. You have to show up in your physical space and practically in ways that you serve and support the people who you're there to amplify. Yeah. W one term that's been, uh, I feel like I've heard a couple of times recently is UXing the UXers. Yeah. Um, and uh, so maybe maybe you're the origin of that, and uh, you're you're spreading it around. Um, so one of the other uh, things that that jumped out at me from your from your book um, is this quote: um, "When Gmail was released, uh, you you said to yourself, someday I have to work at a place like Google." And this was in 2004, so almost 20 years ago. Um, but you have also intentionally recently made this choice. To go work at United Health Group, to go work at Lloyd's Bank, to go work at Walmart, which seem almost the, the they seem very different from Google in 2004 releasing Gmail with almost unlimited storage. And can you believe they would do something like that? So tell me about that between those, those two, two worlds. Those things emotionally are related, but they seem very different, and it seems almost like a conflict, right? But I let me just give a little context. You know that moment. When I was on the I was on the MSN team and I was part of the Hotmail redesign that was happening. And I remember on April Fool's Day, Gmail was announced. And we were all like, oh ha ha ha. That great April Fool's joke, Google, because you know, you'd never give away a, you know, a gig of free storage and, you know, and all that stuff. And then six weeks later, actual invites started going out. And we were all like, oh my God, this is for this is for real. Like at the time at Hotmail, we were charging people $49 a year for 50 megabytes of storage for email, right? Like this is crazy. What I really loved about that moment was, you know, as much as Google, as Microsoft was respected for incredible tech talent and incredible vision and incredible insight, I think they had lost a little bit of that bold and ambitious startup energy. And then Google, of course, was thinking 10x and beyond any of the the current paradigm. And I just realized how thirsty I was for that space. I think the other thing, Andrew, was I, I had left, what, seven years of consulting, being in fast-paced design agencies where I was always asked to be the most innovative and the most creative. And, and then I had spent a couple of years at Microsoft where I had to actually kind of slow down and learn how software, how software is really developed, learn how to bring design into an engineering culture, which is hard. So I think at that moment, I was just thirsting for more. I spent 10 years in Silicon Valley. I ultimately did get to Google and I worked on the modular phone called Project Aura while I was there. I also launched Hey Moto when I was transitioning from Motorola to Google, which became Hey Google, which is incredible. Like I, so I had my chance to work on some of the world's most iconic and innovative and thought provoking tech, shiny Silicon Valley objects. But then I got to say, after a decade of that, moving to the UK, I mean, it was primarily because two of my three kids wanted to study in London and in Europe, and I didn't want to stay behind while they started their next. I wasn't ready to be an empty nester yet, number one. And number two, there's something a bit hollow around the Silicon Valley bubble and energy, I have to say, right? It's overly focused on shiny objects and tech. There's not enough focus on the actual human factors of innovation about desirability. And it's interesting because the courage that I saw in Google with Gmail is exactly the same courage that was required of me to leave Silicon Valley, to lead the Fortune One, to lead the most successful project I'd ever worked on with the redesign of Walmart.com, and then post on LinkedIn, Dan McCoskey, banker, Lloyd's Banking Group. Like people in my social network, in my LinkedIn network, reached out and like, hey, bro, you okay? Like, is everything all right? Like, do you need to see a therapist? Like, what do you, this is not a right career choice. But the ability 
to navigate design in environments that really don't get it. And, you know, 256-year-old British bank desperately needed the empathizing force of design. It has the same level of courage. It's just a different vector. Instead of deep tech, it's more around deep business impact through the empathy of design. The courage to try something new in a new place or a new thing for you. Um, and then, the you know, that makes perfect sense. Then the, you'd spent some time doing something new in a new place. And then you thought, I'm going to go do something new in a very new place, in a very new environment. And that, I think, I think many of us, you know, at various times in our career feel that like, I, I got to, I need to do something different. Something needs to change here. That makes perfect it's, sense. It's really, it's not easy. I have to say, I when I went from Silicon Valley to British banking, I, I, I reset my speedometer, right? I reset my expectations of how fast we would move because the engineering and agile development team were nowhere close to what I was used to in Silicon Valley. Well, we had adopted it. We had adopted it later, and it's banking, which is different than tech, which is yeah, all of those things. Risk and audit and all those things in a regulated industry also slow things down, right? So I, I went in prepared to reset my speedometer, and I was like, "That's fine. We're not going to move as fast. That's okay. Let's but let's move thoughtfully." <laughs> so that was interesting. But what I hadn't anticipated was how hard it was. I did. I hadn't reset my odometer. So using this metaphor, the odometer measures how far you've traveled. And I think as a designer, there's a part of me that still looks at my portfolio and stuff I've gotten out into the world as a measure of my impact. And so, you know, after three years at Lloyd's Banking Group, we did amazing things as a design team, right? Over that period, the, the bank invested three billion pounds in modernization. And as chief design officer, I was accountable for directing that three billion in terms of design priorities to the things that would really have impact. Generally, we moved net promoter score, which is a good measure of, hmm. you know, well, one measure, not the best. I was going to say, uh, are we going to step into that, Dan? No, anyway, that's another it's a measure that. that banks care about deeply. Let's let's go with that one. Yeah. Um, and we moved that from the mid '60s to the mid '70s, and over that three-year period, and every one-point increase in NPS, depending on the business, has you know millions, tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of impact. And so, like we. Over my the course of time there, we did extraordinary things, but I don't have many shiny objects in the three years. That I was at there's Bank. no phone. There's no phone. There's no Aura. There's no Surface. There's no Hotmail. There's no Hey Google. So that was hard, and that almost broke me, actually, but it helped me mature, and it made me focus on what really matters as a design executive, which is the, the careers, the lives, the enthusiasm, and the growth of the 550 designers that we had brought together for the first time. And now we're able to practice design at the next level. Tell me a little bit about how it almost broke you. Like what was hard about this sort of like um, dissonance between, you know, I shipped a modular phone, which if you haven't looked this Project Aura up, it is, it is wild. Um, you know, I shipped a modular phone, like I worked on Hotmail, I did you know, tell me about what that feeling was like holding those those two sort of things in your. I mean, moving NPS ten points for those who have worked on projects like that is massive, massive. But it sounds it, like it wasn't. It didn't feel quite the same. Well, it was actually in the first like it was it was it within the first year, and I had a really critical moment where so my boss Zach Mion, who's very good friends and one of the most inspiring people that I've ever worked with. What was just, uh, really? What was his title? Like, uh, is this? He was when we first talked to each other. He was like chief digital officer, and I told him, like, I'm not ever interested in going to. You're like, why do you use the word digital? There's no digital team at Microsoft and at Google. The only companies that use the word digital are companies that haven't put technology and design in every pocket of the group. Right. Two years later, he called me. He's like, Dan, I'm no longer chief digital officer. I'm like, great. What are you? He's like, I'm chief transformation officer. Awesome. <laughs> and. You know, essentially, it's still the same kind of idea, but yeah. that three billion pound budget was the resources and teeth behind the title to really modernize. Because as you can imagine, Lloyd's and Barclays and HSBC and all the incumbents were getting freaked out with Monzo, Revolut, Starling, showing how kind of a new tech stack and a mobile first design approach is is 
the best way to bank. So when we talked again, he said, you got to come out like this is, and, and that was the moment when two of my kids had said they want to study in London and Europe. So I was like, okay, let's do this. And he and I are opposites, total opposites and opposites totally attract in this case. And I supported him as best I could. And he supported me as best he could. And I remember, you know, several months in, and I just was, you know, we were making a lot of progress on some fronts, but, and I could see the opportunity for us to completely redesign the entire metaphor of how people connect to money, much like the desktop sketch at Xerox Park introduced the GUI to a command line interface world when personal technology was not understandable by ordinary people. Like from a finance perspective, we're still in that command line interface world where you have to be an expert. You have to know the code to be good in finances. And I could see it so clearly from a design perspective, what we could do. And I just said, I, but there was all this goo. So I changed my business card title from chief design officer to chief goo obliterator. And instead of CDO is CGO. And because I was like, I, I'm actually not doing a lot of design work. My odometer is stuck. There's no shiny objects. All I'm doing is obliterating goo, which is outdated mindsets, you know, friction, competitive things, all of that. And we had a talk and I just was like, I don't know if this is for me. This is, I, I just, I can't, I need to have more impact. And what, what Zach said to me was brilliant. He said, and this is a guy that reads a book a week. Like he is voracious intellectually. And he brought together on my team not just service design, but systems thinking. We had a business design team. Like he has the most advanced thinking about the future of work. And he's like, you don't think that I every day have to be patient with this incredible chasm and gap that exists between where I know banking should be and where we are today. It's brutal. And he, and he just kind of shared his own stories of how hard that is and how he has to gauge how to stretch the organization with enough courage that they'll move, but not so much that he or the bank will snap. And he said, instead of you focusing on objects, I know you're a designer and you think tangibly, but Dan, instead of thinking about objects, think about how you can help the people here take the next step towards a more design friendly environment. And if you take satisfaction in that, it'll change everything. And he was absolutely right. And from that moment forward for the next you know, two years, two plus years, I measured my success more in terms of the attitudes and mindsets of people and less in terms of portfolio stuff that designers normally look at. You UXed the UXers, you yeah. UXed the organization, and you you attempted to obliterate some goo. Do was the obliterating the goo, was that before the conversation or after? Like was the conversation like a catalyst for that or I had already started talking about chief goo obliterator, you know, early on actually, because it, first of all, it was the first time I was a chief design officer and the percentage of meetings that I had every week that were executive committee meetings, you know, risk design, risk committee meetings, you know, checking in with audit, meeting with bank regulators. Like it, it, it was nuts. Like I was, the, the weird thing is about design leadership is the, the more senior you get, the further you get away from the work in some ways. And so I was, I think part of me was also feeling like the percentage of my time of doing the human centered insights and design work that I love is so small. Now I'm just, I'm dealing with all of this administrivia and is it really worth my time? And when you're in, like we had one all day, essentially executive committee meeting and probably three or four times during that meeting, I would have something really important to say where design was really important to be there from a, in terms of its perspective. And that made all the difference. But the other 97% of the meeting was tough and you have to have resilience that, okay, I'm just, we're going to work through this. So I think taking on that title, it was just a way for me to be, I don't know, just to poke fun at it a little bit and to poke fun at myself. And there's a lot more goo in the British world. I think we would call it here treacle would be the British term instead of molasses, like treacle is slows you down. And, uh, and actually it was great because part of the reason I was hired was to help bring a new perspective that we could 
and, and the real challenge is, and I had an executive coach during this time, who's still my coach today, who is like, you have to disambiguate between the treacle that is meant to save and protect the bank from a financial risk perspective and the treacle that is holding it back from moving fast in, a, in the place of innovation. So I, I took that title on early and, uh, you know, and it's part of the job. You got to do it. Even if you're working at an Airbnb or a Spotify or an Apple where they've kind of figured out design, the more senior you get, the more goo you end up having to deal with. I want to move on to, to ambitious goals in a minute, but I want to keep us for a second on a little bit of day to day, because I don't know if people know what a, a chief design executive sort of what, what's like a typical day, a typical week. And you've now experienced it at three of the biggest, you know, uh, employers, three of the biggest, you know, companies, um, in addition to, you know, some leadership positions at, at, you know, like a Google. So like thinking about those bigger organizations that, um, you know, have more, maybe more goo, more things to sort of work through. Like, what is the day like? What are you, what are you doing? What are the meetings that you're in? Yeah, it's a great question. And those are all a little bit different. I would say that, you know, Walmarts and Lloyds and United Health Group were all very similar because when you're managing hundreds and hundreds of designers and when your leadership team are senior vice president level, and when you are, you now have accountabilities as a chief executive, you have this, you know, fiducial responsibility, you have you know, media training with corporate affairs, you're helping to t design the story for the next shareholders meeting and doing prototypes that may be speculative that if you get it wrong, would put you into trouble with the UK's equivalent of the SEC. So, so first of all, I think when you're, when you really get to the chief design officer level, you start interacting with whole new entities that I never knew existed before. Like I didn't really know about GCA, group corporate affairs. I didn't really have proper media training. I mean, a little bit when I was even at Microsoft in my 20s and 30s doing Surface and I was asked to give talks, but it was lightweight. And then working with the chief strategy office, um, working with the, the audit and, and risk, those committees. So I would say 20 to 40% of my time as a chief design officer was now interacting with the other dozen chief offices to ensure that there's coordination, there's connection. Like I would have meetings with, you know, Lord Blackwell, who was the chairman of our board and Lord Blackwell, I loved having conversations with him. Like he was so interested in design. Like when I presented to the board of directors at Lloyd's banking group, I had them do essentially a bit of like a more design thinking experience. I had them like do post-its and we had phone core boards and we, we like had like lit, had them listen to the user research and feedback. And they're like, Oh my God, this was the most exciting board meeting ever. They asked me questions at the end. And one of the questions was from Lord Blackwell was how many other banks have someone like you? And I remember at that moment, like not sure where it came from. And I, and because I'm feeling vulnerable, like I, I still, I mean, I have imposter syndrome. I don't know if I actually belong, you know, for a lot of reasons, I'm American, I'm a designer, I'm you know new to being an executive. And I said, well, all the neo banks have a chief design officer reporting either directly to the CEO or one level away, but you are the first incumbent bank to have the vision to go to this level. Now, very soon after Barclays brought in a chief design officer so that, you know, hopefully, I don't know if I, I'm again, I don't take credit, but it's cool to observe. And then we would have these conversations about design and he would say, you've changed my perspective. I used to think design was more like art. I now realize it's more actual strategy and service. So this was so, Lord, Lord Blackwell saying, I used to think design was more like art and now it's like. Wow. Through, through the course of this meeting or the conversations? Through the, so multiple conversations. Like we, um, another thing we did, you know, to go back to that original question of how, what is the day in the life of chief design officer? We would plan a cadence of meetings. So we would have a weekly design crit. So we would have those. And then we also, there was this thing every quarter called a QBR, quarterly business review. Do y'all have that at Figma? Is that a thing? That's part of the way your cycle? We do. We do. You do. Most companies have this, right? Because most companies, particularly those that are public, have this 13-week quarterly cadence. And that's where business, finance, tech, everyone aligns. 
early on, I started a QDR because I'm like, well, I'm chief design officer. I'm accountable for all of design at this institution. It's a quarterly design review. Design is just as important as this thing called business or this thing called tech. And in those QDRs, we would invite some of the executives that would, you know, the next week go to the QBR and try to bring some ideas, bring some feedback, share some of the brutality from a human perspective of areas that we weren't paying attention to, but we needed to. Lord Blackwell came to one of those QDRs. He's like, I want to, I want to see the design team. I want to. So we got on stage together. He was amazed of the diversity and the size of the design team because design previously had been tucked away into like really hidden invisible corners. The design team had a chance to ask him questions and it was just brilliant. So he, Zach, the CEO, Antonio, like that level of engagement, it ended up affecting my day to day and week because now all of a sudden I'm having meetings with all of these folks outside of the design team, right? The rest of that day, I'll just say, I mean, there's so much more I can go into. I'll just say two things. One is I, in my calendar since Walmart days, have always put in my personal life. I have in my diary, my, my, my work diary, when I actually go to sleep. I have when I wake up. I have when I work out in the morning. I have when I you know, back in the day, it was like, it was like family dinner. I put it in my diary, first of all. So that blocks out most of the day and you're then left with the rest of the day, right? And first of all, I did that because executive calendars can be nuts, absolutely nuts. And if you don't control your time, you will not be happy. And for me, I believe in generally trying to focus on a really good 40 hour work week. Because if you start burning more than that regularly, you're just not as productive. You're just not. And you start to burn out. This thing called life and work both start to suck. And so I really try to keep that in check, number one. And then the way I've always started out my day, I put a half an hour, basically start of the day meeting. And at the end of the day, a half an hour orient to tomorrow meeting for myself. And I put it as tentative, right? People can override it if there's something pressing. And it's almost like my digital commute time during COVID because I wasn't doing a physical commute. And it was this kind of reflective time to think about what's going on. I used to meet with my chief of staff at the Barbican train stop at Lloyd's Banking Group. And we would actually walk that. It's only a few minutes, but we would, you know, walk 20, 30 minutes. And we would talk about the goals of the day and who we're meeting with and what's our strategy and you know, and and we do it over, she would have a cappuccino, I would have an Americano and we would, that first meeting of the day was a walking meeting to orient myself. You know, it's just so important for an executive to preserve time. And, um, anyway, lots more stories there, but that's the ask. So, I mean, the big thing, it sounds like that people should think about is the 40 hour work week, like really trying to stick within that, um, block out, you know, your, your personal time, give you some time to orient to being successful. It sounds like take on extra work, trying to evangelize design to the the chairman of the board of what, well, yeah, just kidding. It's not extra work because that's your job. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is a it key is. part of your job. But I do think there's an element there where you basically took on, I'm going to over communicate about this thing. I'm going to do a little bit of storytelling about why this is important, what our customers, you know, are thinking about and caring about. And this person who's curious is, le- and you know, and leaning in, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to them as much as I can to learn what they're thinking about and worried about and make sure that, you know, my team sees that they're thinking about this too. Um, and maybe even, you didn't say this, other executives see how interested he is in design because there's a real signal there for people who are interacting with you or your team or this, you know, what was it? The three, three billion pound modernization budget, you know, Dan, Dan should have a say in how that's working. It sounds yeah. like. Yeah. I mean, that's, in some ways, that's really why I was hired. I mean, Zach had a notion of design as chief transformation officer, group transformation officer. I don't ne- necessarily feel like the CEO and me, his leadership team were super passionate about design in the way Steve Jobs was with John yeah. I back in the day. But I think they were like, oh, well, this Silicon Valley guy, designer American, he's, he, well, he's worked at Google, Microsoft, and he's done some cool stuff. And, you know, I, he's a good hedge on us managing risk that this 3 billion is not used only by people that have been in the banking world for 20 years. Cause most of the other execs that I worked with had been there for a couple decades. 
I so just, I think I have, I, the, the empathy you were displaying here, because I, I've heard the same discussion framed as like, they didn't get it. And instead you're sort of saying like, they got it from their terms. It's risk that we may not be successful in the future. And this is not like that much. Like, yeah. this is not that big of a deal. The level of empathy there, Dan, I don't know if you fully appreciate that. It's impressive. I mean, it's also a bit of realism, too. I mean, watching Brian Chesky talk about Airbnb's crisis during COVID and how, and he, you know, he's the only CEO of the Fortune 500 that actually is a designer. And even he admitted that mm -hmm. before that crisis moment, he had let the left brains, you know, grown ups in business kind of set the tone of how he ran the company, but he intuitively was like, you know, as a designer, I would probably do it differently. And when that crisis hit, he was like, screw it. We're just going to go deep, right? If he, as a CEO who is a designer, struggles himself with bringing yeah. design as a strategic force, how much harder is it for those that have never studied, don't even get design? And in some ways, it's, it's really tough. I have a long-term view that every company is going to have the equivalent of a chief design officer reporting to the executive. And we're going to have more CEOs that come from a design background. One of my career goals in the next decade is to become a CEO. I don't know at what level or at what scale, but I want to continue what Brian has shown that you can bring the forces of design into that executive force because the reality is that business serves society. Business exists to serve society. If you don't meet a fundamental need for somebody, you're going to go out of business over the long term. And sure, businesses make stupid left brain, short term, idiotic decisions in service of like not societal or human centered goals. But over the long term, it's a design, which is the soul of every company. So I'd be shocked if design is understood by CEOs. It's just not. And that's the reality of being a design executive. If you want to struggle with your mental health, and resilience and grow more than you've ever grown in your life, become a design executive. <laughs> if it's not a advice or anti-advice, it's both. Do not become a chief design officer if you know you just want to be showered with love and attention and appreciation. Start a design agency if you want to do that. Well, design agencies have their own issues these days. But anyway, yeah, it's yeah. you have to be resilient and you have to go into this job knowing that. The actual job itself is to help people understand your job and that they'll never understand it and that you just have to help them understand it a bit more. So, yeah. and, and be know, happy with the, the progress. You're, you know, you're being happy with the progress. Like the, the progress that your people, the people working for you are making, the people working around you are making, the, yeah. you know, your peers are making. I think that's, that's some great advice probably. Um, for many folks in many different kinds of organizations too. I want to ask you before we wrap um, about, uh, you have a quote in here about um, your contribution to vision, the vision mm -hmm. of a company. Yeah. And yeah. you write, in all my yeah. years of design leadership, I haven't once been asked, Dan, from a design perspective, what is your vision? Where do you think we should be headed as a business? Mm. Why do you think it is that you have never been asked that question? The brutal truth about this thing called design is that in most companies, the vast majority of companies, design is confused with art, number one. And number two, design is only thought of in its most superficial sense. And these two misconceptions about design end up really limiting how well it can be used. So let's first talk about the art. John Maida talks about the difference between art and design. And I really like his definition. I mean, he says that art is, you know, creates questions to problems, right? Artists see problems in the world. They create art and it provokes all these new kind of questions about it. And that's beautiful. And what artists do is in some ways, it's really self-centered in a good way. Like we need the personal creativity of an artist to question the world and to, yeah, and to just create interesting art. But design is an art. John Maida talks about design as a solution to a problem. The success of design is not judged by how provocative or creative your output is. The success of design is how much you've thoughtfully improved the life of the person who you're designing for. It's an act of service. In fact, it's a, it's a selfless act. It's an act of humility 
that allows design to be more powerful, in my view. Now, sure, design isn't thought of that way. There's thought designers are thought of as black turtleneck wearing, white glass fashionista kind of, you know, ego-centered folks. And sometimes they are. I think that when you put design in that perspective, all of a sudden it's a superpower for a business, a CEO, a leader to say, what is our purpose? Like, where are we going? How can we meet people's needs better? Right. When you think about design, not as art, right? It, it opens up new possibilities. And then the second thing is people think about design as those kind of creative group of folks that, you know, are in their crazy design studio somewhere and they make stuff look good, right? They think about the tactical, decorative, superficial layer of design. And that's part of design. Designers do make things look really damn good and that's awesome. But the soul and spirit of design is so much deeper. Imagine if you're thinking about the role of technology and you're like, you don't think about any of the strategic power of technology and the future of technology trends and what's happening with artificial intelligence and generative now to iterative AI and to other stuff. Like, and if no, no, technology is just code. It's just functions. That's all technology is, right? Like we don't think of technology in that low level, but for some reason people think about design and they think about like pretty icons or screens or just like output. The real purpose of design is, is how do we understand the lives and needs of people? Who are we designing for and what do they need? And then yes, along the journey, you create beautiful things, but more importantly, you create things that aren't just, don't just look good, but they feel good and they help build the business in unexpected ways. So anyway, I don't know if I really answered your question, but I think those two perspectives are so key. And that's why I say that a chief design officer has to give their vision because they're the only ones of all the C-suite, they're the only ones that have this lens of a human-centered view and can see a future through that perspective. And it's so important to get it out there, even if it's rejected, even if it's misunderstood, you have to get it out there. I will say it is true in many organizations that technology is pushed actually to that, like pushed out. And it's just like the people writing the code, they produce the code. How many commits yeah. did you have? Like all those things. And those are some of the same places where design also struggles. So it is, totally. you know, it's it's like these disciplines that are so deep in so many levels and in so many ways that can be misunderstood as just being like this at the top. Your, you know, your points, your stories of like, here's the impact we could have. Um, here's the impact we are having. Um, here's the places that we could go as an organization. Here's the ways we could work. Um, and here's the ways we could be. It sounds like that's like a really common theme in all of the places where you go, where you're just, you're telling stories, you're creating symbols, you're telling people. And uh, I think a lot of that is in the book, right? Uplifting it is, design. It's, it is. I just got my art it. cover. I ordered a lot of it on Tuesday. It's like, it's so surreal to have a book because I never thought author would be a part of a label that I would have. Banker, author, um, crazy. I know. And it's just really pretty amazing because I wrote it in two weeks. That's a whole other story for another day, but I wrote it in two weeks, edited it for then two months and uh, ended up actually giving each chapter, each of the 12 chapters turned into an in-person masterclass that I did at the Royal College of Art and it's filmed. And that's actually coming out next month. And my real motivation for this was to take all of these stories and all of these lessons. And I've recognized that there's, there's not a lot of people that have played at a chief design officer level, and, or if they have, they're not chief design officer level in these places that don't really get designed in the way that I've, you know, experienced. I made so many mistakes in my career because I had nobody to mentor me. I was really lonely for the last couple of decades being the most senior leader, design leader in my, in my company. And I didn't want the next generation to be lonely. And I didn't want the next generation to make my mistakes. So these 12 chapters have 12 principles, 12 case studies, 12 methods, 12, you know, stories and anecdotes that are my offering of stuff that you won't find actually in any other book around design leadership at scale and those things. And actually all the other stuff that's out there is great, but this is like a, it's like a tasting menu of a dozen of the best chief design office hors d'oeuvres of totally different ways to think about how to structure design. Um, a really advanced way of thinking about a two-week design sprint in a new way that I haven't seen either with IBM's Loop 
or with Google Sprint or any of those things. And it's just so, and I hope that people use it. I hope it inspires them and I hope they break it and evolve it and go beyond it. So this just launched. It's number one in graphic arts in new releases on Kindle. <laughs> Otherwise, it's like 60,000 in all books, which I thought was crazy because there's 38 million books on Amazon. And if I'm ranked 60,000th, that means I'm in the top 001% or whatever. I don't do my math well. But it launched. It's out there. Hardcover paperback ebook. And I hope you read it. And I hope you reach out to me and we have a conversation about it. Because now that I know I can write a book in two weeks, I'm going to write a book a year. I might not publish a book a year, but I'm going to write every year. We, and I got more to say. Everybody, we got to hold him to it. Uh, Dan, thanks for joining us on Fig Brew. I really appreciate your time, your perspective, the energy. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you're out there uh, sharing some of these stories with the world. Thanks for pulling out some of those stories, Andrew. It's been great. I can't wait to see how this conversation will unfold. And I love that Figma is championing these stories because as we know, a prototype is worth a thousand pictures, which are worth thousands of words. And even though it's something that seems superficial and tactical, the soul of what happens behind those prototypes is where true design flourishes. So happy to be a part of that journey. And uh, I appreciate the time. Absolutely. Bye for now. Thank you.